Okay, we are live. We are live. All right. Oh, that is bright. Oh, well. I'm doing what I can. We're in the new location for the first time, so we're trying to kind of figure out where our lives are going to be. But right now, it's in front of a very bright window, <laughs> so we're doing our best. Long time, actually it hasn't been, we were live yesterday from Take It Outside, so if you tuned into that, welcome back, it's me now instead of Anna. Uh, a couple things to let you know, it, it's almost the end of August, like holy lord. Our newsletter comes out tomorrow, if you haven't signed up for that, you can do that at churrobuzz.com or on the Facebook page, and that's going to give you a snapshot of all the things that are happening in the coming week, as well as other things happening throughout all of Colchester. It's not just Truro. And there is a lot happening this weekend. The air show is back for the first time since 2019. And if you didn't catch our stories earlier, one of the Truro Buzz staff members is going to be in a plane with some people from the air show tomorrow. I don't want to ruin the surprise, but you're going to want to watch our stories tomorrow, like hardcore, especially. It doesn't even matter if you're interested in the air show. Watch the stories tomorrow because it is going to be a very big day. But the air show is in town this weekend in DeBert. Also, tomorrow is the Take It Outside anniversary, of which I will be at here in the Truro store. If you're in the downtown area, come on down and check it out. They have lots of great sales and birthday cake and prizes going on there. That's going to be from 4 to 6 at the Truro store tomorrow at Take It Outside. So lots of things happening this weekend. Don't miss it for sure. I think that's in the other building. <laughs> oh, the joys of going live. All right, so without further ado, we are here tonight with a special guest. Let me turn here. I know she did ruin the surprise, but if someone didn't see it, Wendy, I'm still throwing it out there. <laughs> it's not gonna be me, nobody get excited. Okay, so Laura, welcome to Live at the Hive. Thanks for having me. I love how well you match the couch. I know, I, it was unintentional, <laughs> but uh, it's a good thing we're not green screening because I would blend right ah, in. That would be so funny. I had that happen on a Zoom call actually before. I wore a teal <laughs> shirt, but it really blended into the green screen background. It was hilarious. So Laura is here with us from uh, Inclusive Financial Planning, and we are talking about finances. Do not tune out. This is amazing stuff we're about to talk about. We are talking about you, your money, financial freedom, and all of the questions you could possibly have, bring them here tonight. So Laura, I think the biggest thing people need to know is what is the role of a financial planner? I think when people think of finances, they get very stressed out. There's a lot of anxiety that comes with money. And really, uh, I actually had a friend, uh, her daughter recently said, oh, so you're basically like a guidance counselor for money. <laughs> Um, that's, that's a really good way to put it, actually. Yeah, so sort of uh, my role as a financial planner is to help you understand what's going on, understand your options, come up with solutions that actually matter in your life, not just like an arbitrary, like, well, you're doing everything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, find solutions that actually matter and like get you closer to where you actually want to be. So it's not about judgment or saying, oh, you're doing all these things wrong, or, um, you know, I don't tell people to put money in jars or anything crazy like that. <laughs> um, but we go in and say, okay, well, you're doing these things and you know, you've said that you know, A, B, and C matter to you and you're not really working towards those things. How can we get you closer? What are some options in front of you that are going to land you where you actually want to be you know, five, ten years from now? Mm -hmm. I mean, we were discussing earlier that money is one of the biggest stressors for people no matter what situation you're in. Every, everybody is stressed out by money to some degree. It's true. I, I, it's... When you look at sort of decision making and a lot of the psychology that goes into money, so your finances are the only thing where there's a literal accounting, a journal of all the decisions you've made. So if you're not comfortable with some of those decisions or you don't feel great about some of those decisions, it can be really hard to look at your finances because you literally have a bank statement that says, you know, on this Wednesday you went into this store and you spent this much money. And there's no other thing in your life that has that level of specificity mm -hmm. while also, you know, coming with all the baggage of, you know, if you were having a bad day that day, well, that's a very stark reminder. So it pulls all of the rest of your life into it. And then on top of that, there's math. So not everyone loves math. <laughs> it's so true. I definitely, not a fan. The hardest part of 
being a business owner was learning to love the numbers because I don't love the numbers. I hate getting lost in the numbers, but I quickly realized you have to be aware of like what's coming in, what's going out, which is the same for everyday life. Exactly. Businesses are usually just a bigger example of personal finances. It's the same thing. Money has to come in, money has to go out. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing that keeps people from talking to financial planners or seeking financial advice is that they're going to be told, like, you can't live your life anymore. You can't spend money on this. You can't spend money on that. You got to put money in RRSPs. And that's just not necessarily the case. Well, and I, I think as an industry, financial services might have, you know, themselves to look in the mirror at. When you look at a lot of financial services, it's a lot of maybe older gentlemen in stuffy suits, maybe being a little more judgmental than we'd like them to. And that's what people have gotten stuck in their minds. And really financial planning is such a more holistic and people grounded practice than it used to be. You know, when you look at what financial planning was 30 years ago, it was really rooted in managing sort of the financial situation of very wealthy people. And, you know, especially with what I'm trying to do, you know, I really want to be able to help everyone. And that's really something that, you know, I've been working in this industry for almost 10 years now. And there are gates, there is difficulty in getting advice. And, you know, you, the places you think you can walk into aren't necessarily equipped to give you the support you need. So it can be really tough when you have a situation that you don't know how to handle to actually get good advice. And then, you know, when that first time that happens, well, you start receding in, it's like anything else. You know, when the bad thing happens, you don't keep going through it to have the bad thing happen again. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I posted a graphic a while ago that I found on one of the accounts that I followed that said, it only takes $27 a day of random spending to blow $10,000 in a year. And I got so many messages and comments and questions on that post. And it's true, like, of course, everybody broke out a, car a calculator and did the math. <laughs> and that is all it took is $27 a day for a year and you've blown $10,000. I don't think people realize how much that they're they might be randomly spending out and what the actual overall picture is do you find you have a lot of people that i don't want to say need to be put on a budget because i don't feel like that's the right one but do people come in to oh god i'm trying to, i'm reaching for the right language it's like are people not necessarily saving for retirement to come to you it's about i want to be able to take a trip every second year or I want to save up to buy a house or I want to have this much disposable income like it's not necessarily about a retirement end goal to see a financial planner no and you know myself I'm a fee-only financial planner so I don't sell products I don't sell investments mm -hmm. um, so I, I work on an hourly basis so it really any situation I can help out with I'm not sitting there saying well unless you have half a million dollars in investments I don't want to see you <laughs> oh my god um, but that's the struggle. Most mm -hmm. financial planners work under that model, so it can be very hard to find uh, access to them. Um, but no, looking at something like that $27 a day, you know, that's eating out for lunch and you know, maybe a coffee in the afternoon. Like It doesn't take very long to get to there. And more what I focus on is saying, well, is, are you doing that intentionally? Are you enjoying that? You know, are you eating out for lunch every day because you know, you're worried about other things and bringing you lunch to work is just one more stress and you, you're not you're going out you're spending this money but you're not necessarily enjoying it you're not getting any value out of it so really I don't come at it from the approach of you know you should be you know you should be doing this and this and that's wrong and that's really not for me to say mm -hmm. it's you're doing these things are you enjoying them and is there a way that you can do them differently to enjoy them more so that $27 a day you know, are you, is it random spending or are you doing it with intention and purpose? And I think that's really the difference maker is you want to be using your money with purpose and you want to be getting the enjoyment out of it. You know, you want to save with purpose. You want to save with intention. You want to spend with intention. That's a really good distinction. I like that. Are you, is that random spending or are you spending with intention? Yeah. That's you know, really good. do you think about it the next day and be like, oh, that was a really great lunch I went out to. I'm really glad I did that. I took that time and connected with my yeah. friends who I haven't seen in a while kind of thing. Exactly. And it, it's a lot of the same concepts you see in like mindfulness and awareness. It's, you know, that same type of philosophy of just being in the moment 
you know, when you're spending money, it's the same type of idea. You know, you should be there. You should want to be doing those things. Mm -hmm. And then it's worth all of the money that you've spent on it because it mattered to you. Mm, that's a really good point. I don't think many people make that distinction. Like, are you spending, oh, someone said, Wanda Dula said, I love that. That is a really good phrase. I love that, spending with intention, which I mean, I guess could be a slippery slope too. It's like, <laughs> I'm intentionally spending this money on that clothes I want. Do I need it? No, but do I want it? Yes. Well, and that's, you know, <laughs> it, it can be a slippery slope, but I think, you know, if it's part of a holistic, mm -hmm. full view of everything, you know, it's really that, if, you know, another way of looking at it, if you do have maybe some issues with spending or, you know, you have some compulsion, compulsive spending uh, issues, you know, if you wait a day, do you still want it? Yep. And that's a way to maybe differentiate between the intention of the moment and the, you know, long-term intention. Mm -hmm. For me, I decided to sit down with a financial planner because I was like, where is my money going? <laughs> like, where is it going? What am I doing? What do I have at the end of the day to show for it? I'm getting coffee every day, maybe twice a day. I eat out once or twice a week. Um, you know, what's going, am I saving RRSPs? So for me, I really enjoyed sitting down and making a plan and a budget. And I mean, some weeks you don't always nail it, but I really appreciated the outside perspective. Like a lot of things, like when you go and talk to someone to cut your hair, someone to, coach you, anything, talking to a friend about a situation, having someone who's outside of your scenario be able to look at the overall picture and say, okay, well, I really feel like, you know, you could cut back on this if you wanted to reach this goal, or what are your goals? Here are ways that we can do it when it's outside the situation is, is really, is really important and helpful. And I think even more than looking at the budgeting perspective is looking at the whole perspective. So, you know, it's very rarely that I sit down with somebody and I don't find a few tweaks that they could do, you know, whether it's managing their debt better or managing their taxes better or making some changes to their investments. There's all kinds of little tweaks that aren't necessarily a huge difference in mm -hmm. as far as effort, um, but can make huge, you know, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars a year in savings to, for you that then might actually fix some of the budget issues you have. You know, if you're sitting there with, you know, a line of credit and a mortgage and a credit card, are you using those all as well as you can be? You know, they're all tools in your toolbox and, you know, you want to use them correctly for the right purposes. Mm -hmm. COVID was a really good um, wake up call for me in that regard. I was carrying a balance on my credit card. I had things that I just wasn't paying off or things like that. And then when I suddenly had no income for three months was like, oh my God. So as soon as we got back to work, my number one mission was like getting that stuff paid off because it sounded like it was gonna happen again. Mm -hmm. And that unfortunately was a really good wake up call for me to get that stuff under control. And it's made a big difference. I absolutely make sure I'm getting that balance down every month now, just in case. 100%, well, and you know, you're a business owner. Mm -hmm. So if you know there's gonna be points in the year when you might be carrying a balance, well, something like a line of credit is gonna be cheaper. Mm -hmm. So getting something like that put in place where you know you know it's gonna happen and you're prepared for when it does happen and rather than paying 20% interest, you're paying six. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, if you have a balance for a few months, well, that's just the cost of doing business rather than that 20% where, you know, that's gonna add up very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely does. I don't know if there's anyone that cannot contest to how quickly credit card interest will rack up versus a credit line. If you're just tuning in, we're talking with Laura from Inclusive Financial Planning, and we're talking about all things money. If you have questions about seeing a financial planner, what a financial planner does, any of the goals that you may have uh, in your own life that you want to ask questions about, definitely type them in the comments and you have a captive audience here. I love questions, so. I know, right? I was saying to Laura when we sat down earlier, like I could talk about finances so much because money is such a stressor and it's so sad that so many people I feel are holding themselves back or feel like they're never gonna retire or can't treat themselves or can't ever go on trips when really just like, like you said, a little bit of tweaking here and there can make a big difference no matter what your goal is. 100%, there's so many things you can do on like, even with how you pay your taxes and how you structure things like your paycheck, um, the way you save money, 
there's all kinds of different tweaks you can make to make that more efficient and more beneficial to you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand all of that, which, you know, unless you're a financial professional, you probably don't want to, then it can be helpful to just sit down with somebody who does understand that and can say, okay, well, I've looked at everything and, you know, maybe it's a little bit of work in the beginning, but once it's all set up, it's really going to kind of run very similar to the way your life is now, but it might be 10, 20% better. Mm -hmm. And in some cases it's dramatically better, but those are, those are usually one-off situations that are usually pretty rewarding when you get somebody out of those holes. But, yeah, uh, extenuating yeah. circumstances, which a lot of people have. Oh, yeah. uh, ideas on how to teach impulsive kids to manage their money with intention. Love that. Thank you, Wanda. Now, that's a loaded question. It is a loaded question. So I'll, I'll say this. So I used to work at the bank, and one of the pieces of advice I would get, because you would, when someone in their, as a teenager would get their first job, they would need to come in and get a bank account to get their first paycheck. And my advice to them was usually spend all of it and learn <laughs> how little money that actually is. <laughs> um, and then that usually was enough to trigger them to realize, okay, you know what? You know, that $200 that I had that I thought was a whole bunch of money went way less far than I thought it did. And you can do this with younger kids as well, you know, working with them to actually sort of gauge what they want and build some goals with them and then see, okay, well, there's a lot of distractions along the way that are going to prevent you from getting there. But the hardest part is sort of teaching them how the, the short distance a dollar actually travels these days. Oh, and getting worse. Exactly. Well, that's a, yeah. inflation is a whole horrible yeah. situation for a lot of people right now. But I think the biggest thing is to just, if you can get that value of a dollar in their head, then they can start to see the need to save to get the things they want. Because those, you know, the chocolate bar that's part of their allowance, well, they can only get a few of those on a $20 a week allowance or $20 mm -hmm. every two week allowance. And you know, it doesn't take long before they start realizing, okay, well, if I want bigger things, then I need to save for them. And the harder thing maybe as a parent is well, withholding some of those items so that they're forced to save a little bit. So putting them in a position where you're not willing to buy it because they're getting an allowance. So then it pushes them, you know, scarcity makes the world go round sometimes and can sort of push them towards that direction of, okay, well, I can't spend all of my money this week because I want this bigger I'm item next week. I'm saving for this, yeah. I remember saving up for my very first TV, 13-inch TV. <laughs> I remember, I don't remember how old I was, but I remember saving my money and saving my money. And when I had enough to go out and buy it, oh my God, I was stoked. I felt like daddy warbucks that I had this money to go buy my own TV. I wasn't even that cool. Mine was a super soaker. So <laughs> I, I mean, there were other things before <laughs> that, but I specifically remember, I think the TV was my first like big purchase item. Yeah. I bought a bike and I think it was a fossil. No, something else. But anyway, I remember saving up. I remember opening up my first Leo the Lion account. Like in my little checkbook. I Those were huge deals to me, but I was a kid that was pretty good at saving. So I'm, I'm glad about that because I see lots of kids that aren't. So that was an excellent question. Thank you so much, Wanda. If that didn't go into enough, if you're looking for something more specific, definitely let us know. Do you find you get many parents coming in with talk, like helping their kids get a grip on money? Because that's not something we talk about in school. It's unfortunately, I actually, uh, I talked to an MLA a few years ago about that whole topic. Mm -hmm. um, and about how like it's really not dealt with in schools and not dealt with in a very meaningful way. You know, realistically finances, money is just addition and subtraction. You know, there might be some multiplication and division in there, but we're talking like grade five math. Mm -hmm. um, the math itself isn't really hard. It's understanding more of the concepts and more of the ideas that go into it. And 100%, I think uh, a lot of parents stress about how their kids are gonna deal with money. And I think there's, there's actually been some research done and you know bank accounts and debit cards make it a lot harder to visualize money that's true my parents were so mad when i got a bank card on my <laughs> own i remember oh they were so mad because i suddenly had access and i'd be like oh i'll take out twenty dollars and take out and then my account was empty yeah and that's you know whereas if you have a wallet full of bills mm -hmm. you can see it it's more tangible and money is such a difficult to understand concept in the first place that not having that tangibility of, okay, I have a hundred dollars because I have five $20 bills, um, can really remove some of that. So it gets a lot harder, I think, to, um, express that. So you really sort of need to find 
other ways. And that's what I meant earlier about, you know, trying to build more of those goals. Cause that's really, I think where you're going to find more of the understanding is more towards, okay, if I want this thing over here, then I need to save for it. Because, you know, the reality is if you don't teach them how to use a bank account, then they're also going to struggle with that. That's right. I think they should really teach like kids to do their taxes. What tax money means, like putting tax money aside. That's something we never talk about. And so many people struggle with every year when they do their taxes and they're like, oh my God, I owe in this much. Or like that's, it's crazy that we would go through school and never learn that. Well, and on the other end, you see a lot of people, you know, that might be in salary positions that get huge tax refunds which they're basically just giving an interest-free loan to the government. Mm -hmm. So they're not getting any value out of it. So no, there's taxes are probably one of the most misunderstood subjects. And, you know, as a financial planner, that's probably where 60% of the improvements I can find for people are, is just in taxes. I bet. I was that person for the longest time. I worked at a place where it wasn't kept, so I was overpaying. I always got a huge return, but it was like, or I could use that money now. <laughs> right? That's more useful in your pocket week by week. Mm -hmm. You know, the government of Canada will spend it for you, but you don't necessarily need to give it to them for free. What made you decide to get into finance? So I, uh, growing up, my parents um, struggled with money and it was always a topic of conversation. It wasn't necessarily a taboo topic, but it also wasn't a positive topic. So I grew up sort of wearing the weight of a lot of those financial decisions that my parents had to make because my dad was very open about it. And as I got older, I, you know, had to deal with a lot and I felt like, you know, those were very adult concerns. And as I got older, uh, I was uh, the big nerd who went and opened a brokerage account when I turned 19. <laughs> That was my 19th birthday special for me. I love it. Um, to start investing, and I realized I really liked it. So I had taken a couple of years out, out after high school, and when I decided to go back to school, I was sort of like, okay, well, I like dealing with money. I like the investing. I like talking to people about these things. And in the back of my mind, I also sort of had that drive that, you know, I really wanted to help people, like my parents, who couldn't get any help, that... You know, maybe there are kids that don't have to grow up with some of those pressures and some of those weights because there is solutions to these problems and there is ways of looking at these things that don't make it as stressful. But, you know, people can't get help. People can't get that advice. So it meant a lot to me to be able to go and learn how to do that. And then, you know, I spent the last 10 years trying to get to a position where I could help everyone. I love that story. That is amazing. My part, uh, husband, I got married, I forgot. My husband also is the same, he loves investing. He loves helping people to understand it. And like, that's just something he wants to move into as well for the exact same reason. Like he loves to see what, how far your money can go, what you can do with it, the fluctuation of the market. I could not care less about that stuff. I have no interest in it. I do it, like I have a financial planner, I have RSPs, but when we have our like, biannual meeting and she tells me how the portfolio is doing and what do you want to do with it? I'm like, I don't know. Like, what should I do with it? I don't know. So God love people like you that care and want to help the rest of us because I am a hundred percent that person. Uh, we did have another question here. Laura, what are your thoughts on the envelope system for bills, groceries, etc. after getting paid? Is it a good idea? So I, I think I alluded to this earlier Thank you for with, your question. The, with the, the jars and if it's helpful to you, then you know, I think it can be useful to get yourself out of a really difficult position, but I look at it the same way as like a really restrictive diet. And are you gonna wanna do that forever? <laughs> yeah. And you know, are you gonna wanna take cash out of the ATM, put it into envelopes every single month for the next 40, 50, 60 years? And the reality is you probably don't. So if you're in a really tight position that that's the only way to sort of get yourself out, you know, there's people in positions where you know, they might have taken on a loan with a very high interest rate and you need to just sort of get things cleaned up before you can get to the next step. Then I think it could be a good stopgap method, but I don't think it's a lasting method unless you really, truly love it. If that's your... It really, really works for you to yeah. have those budgets. But I, I do think that it gets a little restrictive and it gets very hard to manage. And it also comes from more of that like shame and punitive mindset. Oh, you think? 
I, I think it can, where people think like, oh, I'm so bad with money mm. that I have to use this. You know, it, again, if you truly enjoy it and you find value in it, and that's the way that you know works for your brain, then that's totally fine. But if you're coming at it as a, oh, if I don't do this, then I'm gonna overspend money and I'm no good with money, so I have to do this, then it's the same thing as that diet. It's not gonna work. Because at some point, you know, you're gonna have some kind of difficulty and you're gonna get off the rails. So it works for some, but it doesn't work for as many people as probably try. Right, I think that's a really good point because th there's no blanket statement or set of rules that's gonna work for everybody. Everyone's situation is different, everyone's financial needs are different or financial restraints are different. So there's not like this one system is how you do it. This is how you save for retirement and have a grocery budget and save for travel or, and college and all those things. Everyone's situation is unique, so that's just another reason to reach out to a financial planner to have someone that could help with your specifically unique uh, needs. Yeah, and 100% part of that developing of a, a relationship with your financial planner is whether or not you'll have a good fit. Mm -hmm. You know, not everyone's going to like me, not everyone's going to like everyone, and you know, my approach is going to be different from other people's. And you need to find somebody that makes sense for you and works with you and works in the ways that make sense for your life and you know talking about the envelope works well for the way you view the world you need to have a mutual understanding that you know fits in your head day to day mm -hmm. and it could be about all kinds like retirement is obviously a popular thing that people need know they need to save for financial freedom is a huge buzzword these days of people like how can you live for finance and what is financial freedom because it's something different for everybody for me, I wanted to be able to save for retirement, but I love to travel. Travel is my jam. I want to be able to afford to travel without like putting myself in debt. And talking to a financial planner really helped me to put aside money for the things I wanted to do while still affording my mortgage, having groceries, paying my bills, and paying into an RRSP. Do you, do you find you have people who are just saying like, what is financial freedom? Like what, what how do I get there? Uh, financial freedom is when we talk about sort of modern retirement and financial freedom are kind of go interchangeably um, you know when you look at retirement 60 years ago it was that I'm gonna retire to a golf course at and, 55. and I will die at 68 and <laughs> I will drink and smoke my way through those 13 years and that is where kind of the concept of retirement has gotten stuck mm -hmm. But financial freedom, financial independence, is really what most people are looking for, and that's really. Uh, I had one person. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if we're allowed to swear here, so I'll call it I mean, uh, having f off money. Right. Um, you know, where you can just tell everyone in your life to f off if you want to, and carry on with your life as it is, uh, or your employer or boss or, or whoever. Um, <laughs> None of. I see Madison on here. Turn us off immediately. This doesn't <laughs> apply to you. <laughs> Keep going. Um, but yeah, financial independence is really that ability to make the choices in your life that you want to. So, you know, that looks different for everyone. Some people absolutely love their jobs mm -hmm. and they want to work until they're 75, but they might not necessarily want to work nine to five, Monday to Friday, you know, 50 weeks of the year. They might want to do it seven months of the year or four months of the year. And maybe those four months are beachside down oh. south. Um, Can you imagine? No, and that's, but that's where, you know, you can love what you do, but you want to do it in the way that you want to do it. So financial independence is more about defining what you want to do and how you want to do it. A lot of people now, you know, when you look at retirement, it isn't that like cutoff point. Mm -hmm. You know, people start kind of retiring in their 40s now. You know, they start either opening a business so they have more flexibility, you know, if they've worked for somebody else or, you know, start stepping back a bit or hiring you know other people around them so that they don't have to be as involved day to day mm -hmm. you know that transition into you know a not working state sorry another one of my employees jen that also applies to you stop watching you no f off money to tell your boss that you're leaving i'm telling you right now but oh. that's true I, the first time i ever heard that was tyson my husband he had said the same thing like when we talked finances when we got together and what our goals were what the incomes were what we wanted to work towards and he had talked about this well, I want to have this much F off money. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> and it's 
exactly the same thing. It's like, I don't ever want to be stuck. Like, if I'm in a horrible job or something like that, I want to know I have the money to walk away and find something else that was good for me. And that can mean different things. You know, when you're 25, that might mean that you have a year's income. So that if you are in a job that you don't necessarily like, you have the means to leave and go to get another job. It doesn't mean I have enough money to never have to work again. <laughs> can you imagine? At 25, too, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but it usually means more, I have enough money to have options and control of my situation. Yeah. And that's really what most people want, is they want to be able to, you know, choose to go to work, not have to go to work. Mm -hmm. Or they want to choose to do something they care about, not be forced to do something they don't because they need the paycheck. That's right. I think there's a lot of myths, too, about having to save for retirement or putting stuff aside and how much money that actually takes. Or what that means, like, well, that means I can't go shopping once a month like I like to because I've got to put that money. Like, I started saving my RSP, I think something like 25 bucks a month was where I started because that's what I could handle at first. And as I've gone through the years and gotten a little more comfortable and made more money, I've been able to increase it. So, like, I, I think one of the biggest myths is that people think it's really going to disrupt their life to put some kind of budget or plan in place to plan for the future. The hardest thing about starting investing is that the first few years you don't really make any money you know if you yeah. even make a hundred percent on a thousand dollars you made a thousand dollars you didn't objectively make a lot of money and you're not gonna make a hundred percent the first year so it's gonna take quite a while before you start actually seeing your money make money and that's really discouraging so what's important is to get through those initial stages as quickly as possible. So the earlier you can start, even with something like $25 a month, or taking a little bit off your paycheck, or participating in a workplace, you know, group RSP, pension, things like that, as soon as you can get that ball rolling, that you can start to see your money making some money, mm -hmm. then it usually clicks in that there's some value there, but you kinda gotta get to that fifteen, twenty thousand dollar $20,000 mark before you start seeing okay, my money made a thousand dollars last year and I didn't do anything mm -hmm. and you can start to say okay I'm starting to understand how this works yeah that was a really hard one for me to get over when I started with RSPs and I would like check the balance that's like oh <laughs> like I just would like to take that money back but committing to it over time pandemics aside normally yes absolutely you would see it but that's a, it is a slow burn it's not an immediate you're not Elon Musk throwing in that money and walking away with 40 million to throw at Twitter. <laughs> 40 billion. 40 um, billion, oops. <laughs> um, well, and you know, even looking at, you know, are RSPs the right choice for you? Depending mm -hmm. on, you know, what your income is and what your goals are and, you know, whether or not you want to be, say, buying a house or buying a cottage in the near future, you know, those are, you know, if that's money that you want to be using, putting into an RSP doesn't make sense. So that again comes back to that whole tax question mm -hmm. and how best to structure your income. And that's really where, you know, I get into a little bit of the weeds um, as a financial planner into things that most people don't really want to think too hard about, um, but again, can provide a huge amount of value in the long run. Mm -hmm. I apologize because I am 100% monopolizing this conversation because like I said, I love talking about financial stuff. Uh, Knitting Firm says, hey boss, Laura said I could tell you to F off. <laughs> they also said, I think the all or nothing thinking is the worst. Over our savings period, we have put away zero monthly and much more depending on the situation. Absolutely, like there, there is no blanket statement. There is no plan that fits everybody. Everyone's means and needs are totally different. So again, it comes back to why talking to a financial planner that can help tailor a plan to what you need to do could be so valuable. Well, and a huge a part of what I do isn't even necessarily you know the typing up of a written plan it's just having somebody to talk to and say you know here's what I want to be doing and talking through what your concerns are and just getting another person's opinion you know one of the things I'm happy to uh, provide is I call it advice time and it's just you know we don't have to necessarily go through and do a whole written plan but if you just want to sit down for a half an hour or an hour and talk through what your concerns are and what your ideas are and you know lay out sort of what your questions are we can just you know, like we're doing right now, just sort of rapid fire through them and, you know, get yourself to that next level where you might feel more comfortable taking on more planning or if you're not, maybe you're in a great position mm -hmm. and you just want some validation. 
you know, I'm, I'm very also, happy to, to give the approval Also important, that's so true. Oh, it's Deb, by the way. I didn't realize that was your Instagram uh, name, Deb. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> that's really funny. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like, you could just be like, this is where I'm at. This is where I want to be. How do I do it? Yeah, and maybe you are already there. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're just, you know, a little bit anxious and you want that extra perspective or maybe there's a few little tweaks you can make and you know maybe we get into it, it's like okay well maybe this is a bigger topic than you thought it was and there is more that we need to dig into um, but you can kind of start at the pace you want to you don't have to sit down and start signing your life away and you know making major commitments we can just chat for a bit and you know get to know each other and really just start breaking down where your concerns are you know the hardest step I think is that first one of just you know wanting to deal with it and and really breaking down some of those barriers because it is very intimidating and you know even socially you know when you look at a lot of the like advertisements out there for money like they're very you know fear inducing and very mm -hmm. stress inducing and it makes it seem like it's this big thing you have to deal with and really you know we can start with the barest nibbles of just chatting about the things that are you know on the top of your mind we don't have to dig into the whole plate in front of us that is a good point too yeah it, overwhelm is so easy like you just have to get down to bite-sized pieces and work from there exactly it's a you know it's a lifetime process mm -hmm. you don't have to become an expert in the first time you just chat with somebody you know it's an evolution and you know ideally every time I meet with somebody you know they get a little bit more educated they feel a little bit more comfortable but we don't have to go from zero to 60 mm -hmm. the very first meeting mm -hmm. That's true, and there were points that uh, like I had to do some renovations on my home, and I had to scale back my contributions that I was putting in because I needed that money to do the siding on the house or replace my oil tank or things like that. So nothing is set in stone where it's like, well, I've committed to this, and now I'm never going to get that money. It's, well, that's not true. <laughs> like everything is is. Everything is relative. Yes, absolutely. There's no absolutes in finance. <laughs> Which is not really what you hear. You, like finance seems like it is very absolute and it's black and white and it's I have to be saving for retirement now. I have to put this much away. I have to sacrifice. Well, no, no, you don't have to. You just have to figure out what works for you and your goals. One, uh, I had a, a meeting with a client one day uh, when I was working as an investment advisor, and she walked in and she was stressed out about a, a bunch of different things. And I said, "Well, why don't you just take some money out of your RFP?" And she was like, "I." didn't expect you to say that. And I was like, well, if you've got these bills and this and that, and it makes sense from a tax perspective and you're paying this, then if it'll make you feel better, why don't we do that? And, you know, it's not about, you know, this is this purpose and it has that purpose forever. You know, your life isn't that set in stone. You know, you need to have flexibility with all of these things. So just because you're setting money aside for retirement, if something, you know, over here goes wrong. Yeah, now. Yeah, and you need to deal with it, then that just becomes an evolution of the plan. And it's not, you know, if you're finding yourself stressed, like, oh, I can't take that out of here because that's for that purpose and that mm -hmm. purpose. That's just going to make you, in the end, more upset and make mm -hmm. it harder to deal with all these things. Right, and that's another good point for, for reaching out to help no matter what the profession is, but for financial planning. There could be so many options that you have no idea were there, like that you could take that money out, that if you had a tax-free savings account instead of an RRSP or any number of things that you just didn't know were available to you. I, I usually say, you know, money doesn't buy happiness, but it buys options. Mm. So I like that. that's really where, you know, if you're able to get past some of your hangups or you're building towards, you know, your future, or if you already have, you know, a stable platform, then having the ability to make changes on the fly is a lot easier you know it's when you're really strapped and you don't have a lot of control that it gets really hard to get out of that position mm -hmm. but you know if you have flexibility then you can kind of do whatever you want mm -hmm. and that's coming back to that financial independence financial freedom idea you know that's what most people want is most people want to not worry about money that's really what That's financial true. independence is. That is very true. Is getting to a point where they don't actually have to worry about money. Yeah, a hundred percent. Hang on, now I just saw a question. Deb said, "Can we count on CPP?" I feel like we are always hearing that it's underfunded. So CPP was underfunded in the '90s, and there was a lot of coverage of it, and there was some changes made. Um, so CPP now has an independent investment board and a whole investment sort of management company that's owned by the federal government that 
invests the funds to CPP. So CPP is actuarially solid for the next like 85 years, 75 years. Um, so no, you don't have to worry about CPP. That's definitely good to know. Um, what's some advice? Oh shoot, sorry. What's some advice on how to plan for unexpected expenses? That's an excellent question. Thank you. So I think the easiest way to get started with that is with a tax-free savings account. Mm -hmm. There's a few benefits to it. Um, you know, if you you really don't necessarily want to be investing if it's money for an emergency, but it gets it out of your pocket. So most tax-free savings accounts aren't accessible on your debit card. So it sort of creates a new pot of money and, you know, typical wisdom says, you know, you want to have three months of income in your emergency fund. Um, but that's all relative. If you know you're about to go through, you know, a ma major renovation of your house, well then you might want to bump that up a little bit going into that. Mm -hmm. So it's all based on sort of what, where you are. But I think the easiest way is, you know, if you're paid, you know, on a, a bi-weekly schedule, just having 25, 50 bucks go into there. And once that's sort of topped up, then if you built up the, the discipline that that money doesn't really impact your budget, then you have a great source to start your longer term savings. And then you've built up that pot that if you need it, then you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Saving something is better than nothing, even if it's starting off small. 100%. Um, and just having a little bit of a backup can also take a lot of the stress off. You know, that, you know, if you don't get sick time, that you can take a week off. And I, I think we've all seen through COVID that, you know, having a week that you're not going to be feeling great, you don't want to also be worrying about how you're going to pay your rent or how you're going to pay your mortgage that month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, COVID was a wake up in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, are there any financial myths you'd like to, I don't say blow open, but I think that, like, there's a very, there's a lot of myths out there that we have grown up with, like you have to start saving for retirement by this age that, you know, you have to save up this much for retirement. Are there myths you hear very often that you'd like to address say like, this is not the case. You don't have to give up your $5 latte if that's what brings you joy. <laughs> I don't know if that one's a myth. That's just a, that's a personal pet peeve of mine. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you're alluding to there, uh, we were talking before we got started here. Um, you'll often see uh, you know, a newspaper article that'll come out saying, you know, if you stopped buying your $5 latte every morning, then you could retire five years earlier. And you know, you'll see a lot of that in that sort of like millennial finance stuff of mm -hmm. like millennials are bad with money and you're all terrible and it's all your fault. And the reality is, is that, you know, if that $5 latte or whatever that item is brings a tremendous amount of value and you enjoy it, you know, I've, I often joke, you know, if that $5 latte is the thing that keeps you from punching your boss in the face, <laughs> then <laughs> We're a co -worker. it's worth your whole annual salary. Yeah. And, you know, really, it goes back to what I said earlier about that living with intention, spending with intention, is that, you know, you want to spend your money on the things that matter to you and you enjoy. So, really, a lot of those myths, you know, the CPP, actually, that one um, has sort of been simmering since the 90s. Mm -hmm. And I think that scares a lot of people but isn't necessarily rooted in, in truth anymore. But as far as myths, a lot of them are just that, you know, you have to do things. You know, if there's any sort of money knowledge you have out there that starts with you have to, yeah. it's probably not right. You know, there's you shoulds, you know, you should start investing younger because it can make a tremendous difference. You know, uh, mathematically, you know, if you start investing at 20, and you save $143 a month, you'll be a millionaire at 65. You know, that's just math. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are maybe guidelines that are good if you can achieve them, but if you don't achieve them, you're not a terrible person who did something wrong. Your life isn't ruined. No. <laughs> you know, y your life is what you live. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as soon as you get into that have to absolutist thinking, it's probably either a, a marketing pitch or a myth. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Because it, it's not like a, you can have it all. It kind of is, because it, if you're smart with your money and where you put it, you can have the lattes, save for retirement, have your F off money, whatever. You can have it all if you're smart with it. And for me, I decided to give up. I buy coffee every day when I come into work. And when I stopped doing that, 
I was starting to put that money aside and that to me that was a big difference so it could be little things like that as opposed to well I have to put half of my paycheck into an RRSP or a tax-free savings account or an emergency fund like it does I think that's one of the big myths I like to tell throw out to people is that it doesn't have to be like a sizable sacrifice to better your life 100% little steps make big changes and you know whether it's started you know if you get started on your retirement savings five years earlier because you start small that's going to snowball much further than waiting five years and putting even more money in mm -hmm. so it's more about setting up good habits and having good goals than it really is about oh you have to do a b and c yeah it's true that's a good point like if someone says you have to do this it's like probably not the case that's probably what it is for you but going back to that, everyone's circumstances and means are very different. So everything is customizable to what your means are and what your goals are. You know, and really, I, I've done a lot of thinking over the last few months and, you know, a lot of financial sort of myths and, and wisdom out there are all predicated that everyone has to endlessly accumulate money mm -hmm. and that the only goal is being rich. And the reality is that that's not really true because mm -hmm. A, not everyone will be rich and B, not everybody wants to be rich. And just endlessly accumulating money isn't necessarily the end goal for everyone. You know, people want to spend their money or they want to live or they want to travel or whatever, you know, that means to them. And having, you know, a big investment portfolio doesn't really matter that much to them. You know, it doesn't mean that they don't have longer term goals that still need to be met, but they don't necessarily want to be, you know, multimillionaires at any point in their life. I mean, that'd be all right, but it doesn't have to be your end goal. <laughs> no, and, and you know, really, there's a lot of different ways of looking at that. And I've been really thinking a lot about sort of that endless accumulation of wealth and a lot of those myths and a lot of the guidance you get out there is all predicated that the best answer is just always having more money. Mm -hmm. And that isn't really the case for a lot of people. A lot of people have different goals and they have different objectives and things that they want to do in life that you know run counter to having the most possible money and that's okay mm -hmm. you know if we all if all of our goals were to just have the most amount of money nobody would travel nobody would eat out and nobody would do anything that's and true. our economy would collapse so <laughs> yep so really you know it's part it's all about balance and perspective and at the end of the day actually enjoying what you're doing mm -hmm. If you're just tuning in, we're talking with Laura from Inclusive Financial Planning, and I warned her before I started this, I was 100% gonna dominate this uh, conversation because I love talking about money and spending money and saving money and all kinds of things. So if you have a question, please by all means throw it out there. We've had some really good ones so far. Oh my God, it's 10 to eight. It's like the fastest 50 minutes ever. <laughs> I really could talk about this all the time, but one thing I really wanna to touch on before we go is a big topic of late, obviously, has been um, inflation, rising interest costs, and the poor people trying to buy homes in today's market. What advice would you give to people who are watching this housing market, which is kind of finally starting to come down a little bit, if they're trying to save for a house or wondering what they should be doing? Should they be saving for a house? Should they be looking at it now? What advice would you give to them in this kind of um, market of inflation right now? So. We'll separate maybe inflation as a whole from the, the housing market because that is, um, you know, what has been happening in the rest of the country in the housing market has finally caught up with us. I think COVID really uh, brought that to our shores, for lack of a better term. Um, and really, real estate as a whole has never been like a great investment. You know, even with maybe some examples outside of Vancouver and Toronto over the last 30 years, but on a long-term basis, if we look over like 50 and 60 years, real estate tends to be a pretty middling investment. So it's important to not think of it that way. You know, if you want to buy a house, focus on, you know, the house being the house you want it to be and giving you the lifestyle that you want. And, you know, obviously you need to budget within your means and don't buy too much house or more house than you can afford and but the other reality is these days you probably also need to be maybe cognizant that if you're buying a house it's maybe going to be something you're going to be holding on to for five or ten years because if prices do go down you might get stuck in it mm -hmm. where your mortgage is uh, the term is underwater where you owe more on it than it's worth um, oh god that's terrible.
terrible, and it's so true. I haven't heard that term. It's um, it's it's an unfortunate thing, and it happened mm -hmm. to a lot of people in 2008, 2009, and it really it gets you kind of stuck in the house. You know, over the long run, uh, you know, prices will come up. You'll keep paying down the mortgage. It's not a permanent state of affairs, but it can get you stuck, and that's why you, I, I usually recommend if you're in the market, you know, if you can have a larger down payment, uh, especially with rising interest rates, that's going to be helpful for you. And really know that that's the house you want. You know, people sometimes get stuck in, I need to be in the housing market or I need to own a house because prices are going up and up and up. And, you know, they may go up, they may go down. You know, we've seen that cooling. So people have at least seen that they, there is an up and down factor to it, but really you know you want to just keep a level head and i think really focus on getting the house you want because the financial side of it is so rough right now you know with interest rates where they are mortgage rates where they are and housing prices where they are you're going to be paying a lot for it so you might as well at least get a house you like mm -hmm. that's a very good point yeah it's it is so you think that getting into the house like a lot of people i have heard an argument for investing in real estate versus RRSPs, did you say that's not necessarily the right way to go? I mean, it's a very different experience. So people often think of investing in real estate as this like risk-free, easy money. <laughs> and Why? if anyone is out there uh, listening to this has ever owned a rental property, it is not easy and it is not simple and it's usually a lot more work than you want it to be. And that's really the reality with real estate is it's not as simple or as easy as people think it is. And they often extrapolate, or sorry, uh, sort of separate, you know, owning a house from owning real estate. And realistically, a house as an investment functions the same way. So it is um, volatile. The prices do go up and down. You know, you may not necessarily make money on your house. So that's what I mean. I, I look at it more as mm -hmm. it's a lifestyle asset that you know, if you happen to make money off of it, then that's great. But if you don't make any money off of it, well, you live there and that's also okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's better to take more of that mindset of this is something I'm going to pay to live in. And if I get value out of it and enjoy living there, then it was worth the money. That's a really good point. Really good distinction. Well, that takes us up to almost an hour there. Laura, if people thoughts on an income property. So I think that kind of ties yeah. into what I was just saying. So okay. an income property is a business and you are going to have to deploy capital into it. Um, you know, I, I've often said with real estate, you need to be able to write the check. So when something goes wrong, you need to be able to replace it or fix it or renovate it or whatever happens to it. So it's not as simple as just, I'm gonna buy this and I'm gonna it's collect gonna rent money. and yeah. I will just profit endlessly. You know, it is, you're buying a volatile asset, so the price of it could go, or the value of it could go down. Um, you might have to put more money into it than you think. So if you're willing to take on that business risk, then like any other business you're actively managing, yes, it is. it has the potential to make you more money than investing in the stock market because you're actively involved in it and you're doing work, you're spending your time on it, but it's not just a slam dunk, you're gonna make a whole bunch of money. Yeah, no, that is a good point because I don't know if enough people consider what if something goes wrong. What if you have bad tenants? What if there's damage to the property? But I do know a lot of people that invest in real estate or have rental properties. And it can be a great business, mm -hmm. but I think you need to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. It's a business like any other where, you know, you're going to be spending your money. You're not always going to profit and you need to be prepared for that. So it's not that it's a bad business, but it's a business like any other. And well, like you were saying, going through COVID, mm -hmm. you know, can you afford to not make any money off it for six months to a year? Or can you afford to hold on to it for the next five years because the value of it's gone down? You know, you can get into those positions. It's like anything else, there's risk. Mm -hmm. So it's just important to value that risk and to have the right understanding of the risk you're taking. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, is there anything else that you would like to touch on that we didn't cover? I mean, I know we could always talk about this. We should probably just do this as a regular thing because God knows there's always enough to talk about when it comes to I was about to, to say, uh, I think we need to make this a regular feature. Yeah, uh, I'm into it. I could definitely, <laughs> definitely get on board with that. Uh, thank you. I like the idea of being more hands-on. Stock investments terrify me. I, I hear you 100%. And it's funny, as you were explaining that, it was like, it is the same as, as getting into the market because you don't, 
you have a little more control of it and it, that it's a tangible thing, but you never really know. Are, are market prices gonna go up? Are they gonna go down? What's gonna happen? Uh, thank you for demystifying real estate. <laughs> real estate is a touchy one, uh, mm. you know, especially right now. You know, we're seeing now what people have been seeing in Toronto for the last 20 years is that there's a bunch of people out here who have now made a bunch of money on real estate. So now there's a bunch of people that are now real estate experts and can tell you how to make a bunch of money off real estate when really it was kind of luck. It was luck that they owned it before. It was good conditions. Yeah. 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 They didn't create the situation mm -hmm. that then benefited them. Mm -hmm. So you always have to take that with a little bit of a grain of a, a little bit of a, a salt that you know, when we look at real estate in Truro before COVID, you know, it was a, it was a pretty slow burn. You know, oh most people gosh. were, you know, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of effort. And that's really what you need to be ready for with real estate yeah. is that it is going to be a lot of effort and it's going to be a lot of time and you can make money off of it, but you need to be cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. Well, Laura, this has been fantastic. If anybody wants to continue any of these conversations with you, where can they find you? Uh, so I'm online, uh, inclusivefp.com. You can uh, reach out to me through there. Uh, I'm also on Instagram, inclusivefp, and Facebook. I'm also on LinkedIn. And, <laughs> and everywhere. Online, every platform. Uh, and I also uh, host a podcast called Let's Talk About It. I'm very excited to check this out. Well, I, I hope it lives up to the hype. <laughs> um, it's just me monologuing. So if you've enjoyed no, just it. listening to me talk, it's all this. It is. Um, so I, I, uh, I put one out every week. Um, I'm actually, uh, my next week will be my 20th episode. So oh, there's, good. yeah, there's all kinds of different things on budgeting, investing, uh, managing debt. Uh, this week actually uh, was on uh, choosing a financial advisor. Um, so you can uh, listen to that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Wherever Google, you get Amazon, your podcasts. All of them. It's all out there. Oh, I'm exciting. everywhere. I, you know, I like it. Let's talk about it is the podcast. Laura at Inclusive Financial Planning is where you can find her. You can always hit us up for the contact as well. Um, thank you, Laura, from Diane. And, and thank you for the questions. I'm glad it wasn't just me. I mean, it was mostly me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope you guys found that helpful. But I, I just love... I never want people to feel like they're helpless or they don't know where their money's going or they can't better their situation because you absolutely can. You just have to find the right people to help you take the overwhelm out and help you meet the goals you have. And that was 100% my goal when I started inclusive financial planning. You know, even if you look at my logo, you know, the us is, is highlighted and it's really that us working together. It's not me telling you what to do. It's not you know, you feeling lost. It's us working together to find the solutions that make your life better. Awesome. Uh, I'm sorry if Instagram cuts off before I get there, but thank you so much for joining us. Definitely find Laura online. Uh, hit us up if you need her contact. Let's talk about it podcast. And if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, that is coming out tomorrow, served into your inbox with all the amazing things that are happening. And tomorrow I will be at Take It Outside for their anniversary party, four to six. Check that out. Uh, one of our worker bees will be jumping out of a plane with the air show tomorrow. Definitely be checking online for that. And the air show was also this weekend. The X is on right now. There's so much happening. You have no excuse to be bored. Get out there, people. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And until the next time, have a wonderful week and the rest of your August. Oh my God, where did it go? I can't believe it. School starts soon. School starts soon. Oh my God, it'll be school podcast or live soon. Okay, have a good week. I don't know where to end this one. Oh, there we go.